So now we're ready to make our first chess piece, the pawn. It's fairly simple, but we're going to use a slightly different approach than you might have seen before to get some really good watertight geometry. I'll show you why the usual methods are bad after we quickly add a reference image to work with. It's usually a good idea to use a reference when modeling, so I found an image of a pawn that I vaguely want to follow, and I'm going to import that into Blender. So, first of all, press 1 on the numeric keypad to switch to the front view. This step's important because your reference image will be aligned with whichever view you're in when you add it, and we'll do a lot of modeling in the front view. Press Shift now to bring up the Add menu, and about halfway down is an option called Image, and expanding from that are these two options, and the one we want is Reference. When you click that, a file dialog box will appear, so find your image. My reference images are here, so I'll select my pawn, and in the 3D view, you'll see it's centered in the front view, slightly larger than the default cube. Now, at the moment, it appears behind the default cube, so a few parameters have to be changed to make it easier to work with. Over in the Object Data section, which is this red triangle icon at the bottom of the Properties window, we can change a few things to make it better to work with. First, change the offset in Y to 0. That moves the center of the object to the bottom of the image, so it sits on the y-axis. Next, change the depth to front, so it always appears in front of everything in the scene. It's completely opaque at the moment, so we can change the opacity to somewhere around 0.5, so we can see through it while we're working. And then finally, check the Only Axis Aligned checkbox, which means that we'll only ever see it when we're in the view it was created in, which is the front view. This helps to make sure we're in the correct view when we extrude the kind of body of the pawn later. Now, my reference images are a little off-center, so I'll just press R in the 3D view and rotate it slightly to straighten it up. That was good enough to work with, and now I want to make sure that I can't accidentally move it. If you followed the setting up video in this series, you'll already have the restriction toggle for this set up, but if you didn't, then just do the following. Go over to the Filter drop-down section of the Outliner, which looks like a little funnel. And this lets us change what Blender calls the restriction toggles, which just allows us to change some common attributes of our objects in the outliner. The one we want is the small arrow, and when we dismiss this dialog box just by moving the mouse away, we can see that this icon now appears next to every object in the outliner. And if you click the one next to this empty, which is our pawn reference image, we've now made this object unselectable in the 3D view, so it won't get in our way when we're selecting parts of the model. I should have really done this as soon as I created the object, but now is a good time to rename it to Pawn Reference Image. Now we can get going. First of all, let me uh, just delete everything and show you what you'll normally see when people make a pawn. So what you'll usually see is that uh, people start at the bottom, uh, like this, with a mesh circle. And they'll be extruding loops up, following the reference, until they get to the top where it's kind of sealed off, normally just by scaling all the vertices to zero, uh, which makes a lot of triangles, which we which we don't like. And then uh, we create a sphere, and we move that up to the top, and then the sphere is either parented to the base, or the two meshes are joined together to make one. Either way, this is not a subdivision surface in any way. It uses lots of triangles, it's not watertight, uh, which means it can't accept any kind of transparency, or internal lighting, or subsurface scattering, and many other processes it may have to go through will simply not work correctly. We need a two-manifold watertight mesh made from all quads with a sensible resolution. And we can see at the top there's all this pinching because of the triangles in the UV sphere. It's just not good enough. We can get rid of this. It's rubbish. Now for a start, using an arbitrary circle and guessing at how many vertices to use is a bad way to start. The main area of detail on a chess piece is at the top of the piece. So the resolution of that part of the mesh should drive the resolution of the rest of the piece. We will model from the top down. It will make sense if we just dive in and make it. So now, in the front view, we can start with a cube, which we're going to use to make a quad sphere for that ball on the top, perfect for subdivision surface models. So press Shift and A to bring up the Add menu, then select Mesh and Cube. Rename it straight away by pressing F2 and typing Pawn, then hit Enter. The quad sphere is the best sphere to use in subdivision surface modeling, and we can create one easily by adding a subdivision surface modifier with a level of 3 to our cube by pressing Control and 3. Then immediately apply the modifier over here in the section with the blue wrench by hovering over the modifier itself in the panel and pressing Control A. Now this turns it into a ball, but it's not quite a sphere. In the previous sphere video, we used the to sphere operation by pressing Control Alt and S, but this time we need a constant spherizing effect on our mesh while we work, so we're going to use a modifier called Cast, which can be added using uh, the modifier panel here. Oh, actually. Because you may not have followed the setting up video, you won't be able to bring this menu up with a key press, so I'll go over to the modifier panel and select 
cast from this drop down menu. We can leave everything at its default value except for the factor, which needs to be changed to 1. Uh, why that's not the default, I don't know, but it's not, so change it to 1 to make it a sphere. Now turn on the switches at the top of the modifiers property box for edit mode and on cage, because we need to be able to see the effects of this modifier while we work. There are a few points which need to be adjusted to make the sphere work properly, but we can't do that until we're finished with the cast modifier, so we'll do that later. Make sure you're in the front view by hitting 1 on the number pad and press tab to go into edit mode. Now click anywhere outside the mesh to deselect everything, and then click just below the bottom middle of the mesh, and the very bottom vertex of our sphere will be selected. You can orbit the camera around with the middle mouse button to convince yourself that you've got the correct point, but this method's reliable and it, it will be the right one. Now press Ctrl and plus on the number pad to expand this selection once. If you now press X on the keyboard and select vertices from the pop-up menu, this will leave us with a square hole in our model. And this leaves us with a very useful loop of 16 vertices around here, which we can use to create the rest of the piece. Now very importantly, check that the transform pivot up here is uh, set to median point. So the blender always makes the center of our selection the basis for any extrusions and scaling. The other options won't work properly, and we generally always use median point when extruding and scaling loops. Now Alt and click on any edge on this loop and the whole thing will be selected. Now with the mouse close to one of the selected vertices, press E to extrude, and then immediately press S to start scaling it. Move the mouse to scale it in a distance which keeps the new faces approximately the same size as the rest of the mesh. Now you may feel that the scaling is slightly unusual, and that's because the vertices are all still under the control of the cast modifier, keeping our shape spherical as we adjust it. This is exactly what we need. Now just left click to confirm this new position. Now we want to transition to a circular hole, and this loop will be the first step. Over in the end panel, just press N if you can't see it, go to the edit tab and open up the loop tools menu. The one we want is circle. Click it and you'll see that our new loop has become a circle. If you followed the setting up video from this series, you could have just pressed Q and selected circle from there instead. Now, in the temporary properties panel over here at the bottom of the 3D view, change the influence to 50%. This makes everything a little more square again, which helps to equalize the transition to our circle. Now we can press E again to extrude and immediately press S to scale it down a little further. Then left click to confirm this position. And again, choose the circle tool from either the end panel or your quick menu if you have one. This time, set the influence in the temporary properties panel to 100% to make it perfectly circular. Finally, press E one more time to extrude a final loop, and press S to scale it down just a small distance. Now, when we tab to object mode to take a look at it, we can add a subdivision surface modifier to it by pressing Ctrl 3, and set it to shade smoothing with the right click menu. We'll see that we have a circular hole, and the spherical shape has been maintained. The cast modifier is finished doing its job now, and it can be applied in the modifier panel. In fact, it has to be applied, otherwise it wouldn't allow us to do any of the following tasks, as it would constantly try to force the mesh to be a sphere. So head over to the Properties panel, press Ctrl A while hovering over the cast modifier to apply it. Now if you watched the video about spheres from this series, you'll know that there are some problem areas that cause bumps on the quad sphere, and we need to deal with them now by moving some vertices into better positions. A full description of this process can be found in the lesson on spheres, but it's, it's fairly simple. Tab back to edit mode, and look for one of the vertices on the body of the sphere which has only three edges coming out of it. And from the select menu, choose select similar and amount of adjacent faces to select all of the other problem vertices around the mesh. Now press S and type 0.9946 and hit enter. Now press Ctrl and plus on the number pad to expand this selection out, and press S again and this time type 0.9983, then hit enter. Now the head of the pawn is done, and we can extrude out the body from the hole that we created in the head. So now Alt and click to select that last loop surrounding the hole, and switch to the front view so we can see our reference image. I'm only vaguely going to follow this reference image, as I may want to see the connection area between the body and the head, because we can. Now if we press E to extrude, we'll have a new loop which is immediately in translate mode. So press Z on the keyboard, and this will constrain the movement to the Z axis. I'm going to move it down a little, and then I'm going to keep extruding other loops. Either hitting Z to constrain the movement to the Z axis, or press S to scale them. Because our transform pivot is set to a medium point, they will scale correctly. Now use as few loops as you can, as the subdivision surface modifier will do all the work of adding the curvature, and the fewer loops you create, the lighter your model will be, which is a good thing. 
If you make any mistakes, you can alt-click on any loop and press X and dissolve vertices, and that'll get rid of it smoothly. Now, when you get to the bottom, add uh, two loops close together without scaling either of them. And then add two more loops where you only scale them to create a fairly tight but still realistic curve over the bottom of the piece. Now, because we have 16 vertices making up the cut, we can easily use the grid fill command from the face menu or the quick menu if you follow the tutorial on setting Blender up. And as usual, I may need to change the offset to align the grid fill up with the axis, but you don't really need to do this. And that's it, that's the modeling done. Now, as we did with the chessboard, we want to make our pawn an appropriate size to be used in scenes. Uh, and we can do this by changing the Z dimension in the end panel to four centimeters. And then hovering over the Z scale and pressing Control C, you can then move and paste this value into the other dimensions using Control V while hovering over them one at a time. One final step is to move the origin of the object to the very bottom center of our mesh. So I'll tab back to edit mode, select the very center vertex on the base of the mesh. Now press Shift and S and select Cursor to Selected. Tab back to Object Mode, right click with the object selected and choose Set Origin, Origin to 3D Cursor. If you do have the quick menu from an earlier video, you could just use that for both of those operations. Finally, set all of the location parameters in the end panel to zero, then press Control A in the 3D view and select All Transforms to finalize our object. Save your scene and we're finished modeling the pawn. It's a watertight, two-manifold mesh made from all quads and at the correct real-world scale to be used in any scene. In the next tutorial, we're going to model the bishop, and we won't be using the Boolean modifier at any point.